Let me just add my welcome to everybody uh, and acknowledge we have our former chief of staff, uh, General uh, Schwartz, uh, currently the director of uh, business executives for national security with us and uh, General Chandler too, so thanks for being here. Um, welcome to our special uh, session this afternoon um, with uh, uh, General Chilton. Uh, I've had the very good uh, uh, fortune of having to know uh, known General Chilton for now, I think I computed it, 28 years. Uh, he was the premier uh, RF4C driver on uh, uh, Okinawa, and I had the good fortune to uh, fly with him, both in the simulator and in the airplane when he was transitioning to the mighty, uh, mighty F-15 Eagle. Uh, and then he went on from there, as many of you know, uh, to uh, test pilot school. Um, he flew uh, three missions. He was commander of STS-76, his third space shuttle mission, uh, and then was uh, later the deputy program manager for operations for the International Space Station. You know he was a commander of Strategic Air Command. He commanded Air Force Space Command, a numbered Air Force, uh, and a wing. So he comes to us with an unmatched set of insights and expertise. Uh, and today the subject is going to be nuclear deterrence. And because of the knowledge level of the crowd, we chatted a little bit. Um, he's not going to give you deterrence 101, but he's going to go into perhaps how to deal with some of the challenges of those um, uh, who uh, oppose the fundamental values and virtues and the importance of nuclear deterrence. So with that, Please help me welcome General Kevin Chilton. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Thank you. Well, when, when Peter uh, asked me if I'd do this, he said, when are you going to be in Washington, D.C. next? And, you know, I look at my calendar, and I said, well, I got about a three-hour three window at the end of a meeting on this morning. And he says, well, it's just a small gathering of, of folks. We'll just, if you wouldn't mind coming by and having a quick chat. So I thought this would be like a six people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I look out and here's my, I got former bosses, former colleagues, former mentors and teachers and friends here and it's, uh, it's great to be with you all. This is really uh, humbling just to stand in front of you. And, and so, as Dave said, um, I, I'd, I'd like to just talk a little bit and, and then open up for Q&A. One of my challenges is I don't ever just talk a little bit. I get going and on these topics, I get so passionate about them and I run at the mouth. So. Uh, throttle me back, Peter, if you can, so we can, we can get into the Q&A. And one quick Zaytar story. So um, it, it's a really long backdrop to this story, but when I transitioned from the F-4 to the F-15, there was a policy in Tactical Air Command at the time that you could not do that if you were an RF-4 guy. It was against the rules. And so uh, the Pacific commander said, well, we don't have that rules in the Pacific, and there was always tension between TAC and the Pacific. And, <laughs> So he said, I'm sending him to Luke anyway to check out. And they said, well, he can't fly our airplanes. He said, well, OK. Well, he's going to do your academics. So I went to Luke. I never flew the airplane. And they wouldn't even allow me to get in the simulator. And so what I found out, though, was there were these, uh, civilians that ran the simulator from Singer, I think. And at night, starting at 5 PM, the last student would leave, the last instructor, and they'd turn the simulator over to them for maintenance. If there was no maintenance going on, they just sat and drank coffee all night. So I met these guys, and I went over there, and they said, well, I told them my dilemma, and they said, well, hop in the simulator. And so, and since they looked over the shoulders of instructors all the time, they could give as good a sim as any qualified F-15 instructor pilot. And I went over every night for a month. Well, you normally would get maybe a, you know, a dozen sims. I had about 30. <laughs> No grade book, no documentation that any of this had ever happened. And so then I get on the plane, I fly back to Okinawa where they're gonna do me a, give me a local checkout and I'm going over for my first official graded simulator and Captain Deptula is my instructor pilot. And he gets in and you know, he's thinking, okay, we'll see if he can start the engines. You know. So I start the engines. Well, let's see, can he handle a fire? Can he handle two fires? Can he take off? Can he do an intercept and have a fire? And I'm just smoking this simulator, you know? <laughs> and he keeps throwing out malfunction and malfunction after me, and I'm just handling it. I'm doing, you know, every possible thing you could do in the simulator. And afterwards, I can tell he is visibly frustrated. Because Dave's a tough grader. He's filling out my grade sheet, and he's going line by line, and he's stopping and thinking, checking a box. I can tell he's just angry. He finally gets to the bottom of this thing, and he goes, I'm, you can be graded zero to four, with four being the best. He says, I'm giving you a four, he said. 
I've never given anybody a four before <laughs> on any simulator ride. How did you do this? <laughs> so I had to fess up. I was probably the high tie simulator, high time simulator guy in the F-15 community, having never flown the airplane. But uh, so Dave and I have been friends since that day, and uh, it's been a great, great friendship. And I'm really appreciate the invitation from both you and Peter to be here today. So nuclear deterrence. We'll avoid. We'll dispense with why we need a deterrent and deterrence when I want it. And what I want to do is turn you into apologists for the deterrence. Okay. So I was a I was raised Catholic, and part of our training was Catholic apology, which meant how do you defend the faith? So we're going to learn how to defend the nuclear faith here today, or at least talk about the subject, and talk about some common arguments you might hear uh, when you sit down and talk to someone who maybe hasn't quite thought as much about deterrence as you have, or um, has been brought up with a predilection that, that nuclear weapons are indeed bad and uh, not useful for the defense of the United States of America. One of my one of the ones you will always hear is, you know, is, is, and I believe in, in always emphasizing the destructive force of these weapons and just how terrifying they truly are. They are scary to me. Personally, I hate them, it's, but it's a love-hate relationship. They're a necessary evil in today's world. Uh, the argument goes, well, look, if they're so awful and so bad, we know no American president will ever use them. So if we're not ever going to use them, why do we have them? That's the logic they, they try to present. What they fail to understand, because they fail to understand deterrence, is that we use them every day. We deter every day. The fact that we have men and women in silos every day, on submarines every day, and our bomber force prepared to generate, and our tanker force prepared to generate every day, our nuclear command and control that is exercised every day, from the Pentagon down to the forces in, in drills every day, the fact that we have those means we're using them. And we're using them for their design purpose. They're not designed for warfare, necessarily. Well, ultimately, they have to be to be credible. They are designed to deter. And you need to always bring the argument back to that when you talk to people about why we have these nuclear weapons. In fact, I, I tell our young airmen uh, and soldiers and sailors and Marines whenever I talk to them that their highest calling is not to give their life for their country. Okay? It's not to fight and die and win our country's wars. Yes, you have to be prepared to do that. Your highest calling is to deter and give our nation the opportunity to achieve, secure its national interests and achieve its objectives without ever having fired a shot, which is the essence of some of Sun Tzu's philosophies. And, and the nuclear deterrent is every bit as much, much of that. Um, we use our deterrent to deter, as do the Russians. I would argue the Russians of late have used it for another purpose. That is to coerce. Um, you might suggest, you know, they, so they invade the Crimea, and, and by the way, it was an invasion of sovereign territory. Uh, they invade the Crimea, and then they immediately conduct uh, on YouTube, make sure it was videotaped, a nuclear exercise with uh, Putin directing his forces to launch a nuclear strike, which then is followed by video of a missile coming out of the water and flying over to Kamchatka. And, and, you know, listen, that's, that type of rhetoric uh, is a demonstration of will, shortly followed by an announcement that uh, forces would be moved into the Crimea to make sure nobody countered their, their invasion. Um, yeah, deterrence, coercion, a little bit of both mixed there. However, I think a real clear sign of coercion is when um, Sweden started musing about perhaps joining NATO recently. And, um, that should be a nice thing for the U.S. We always wondered how neutral they'd be in the Cold War, <laughs> especially for our folks flying out of England that maybe had to transit their airspace in the war plan. Um, and then uh, the Russians said, you know, uh, they conducted a, uh, a nuclear training exercise and made it very blatantly clear that all their targets were in Sweden. And then Sweden came forward and said, you know, we've, we don't want to upset the Russians, so we're not ready to consider joining NATO at this time. Here's an example of how you can be coercive, I think, in adjusting another person's policies by, um, by using your nuclear deterrent. In the, I, I firmly believe we just use it to deter. The Russians, I think, distinctively use it both to deter and coerce. And, uh, but in any case, we use it every day. It, a, a while back, there was a move for, uh, and there still is today, 
uh, a notion called prompt conventional global strike. When I was a commander of Space Command, I was a big proponent of it. And I was for a short period of time as a commander of STRATCOM, and then I actually argued against it. The, the notion was that, um, well, the notion really started out with, uh, with a rather crazy notion that, you know, what if a terrorist got a nuclear weapon and we need to reach out and touch him anywhere in the world real quickly, and we wanted to do it with something other than a nuke, so we need to put a conventional warhead on an ICBM that we can quickly target to hit them before they move. Well, it takes 30 minutes. You don't have to move very far to survive a conventional prompt global strike if you're a terrorist. So that argument I never bought. I like the idea, though, of maybe going out after some fixed assets that are really important to me as the commander of space assets that might degrade uh, or deny an adversary's capability to put my assets at risk. And, and some of those targets are pretty deep in, in uh, countries of interest, and you don't want to give the president only one option of a nuclear attack on him. So that was why I kind of liked him for a while. But then people started talking about, well, you know, we can actually decrease, as part of arms negotiations with the Russians, or even unilaterally, the number of ICBMs we have with uh, nuclear weapons on them and replace them with conventional and still make them part of the deterrent. Because after all, you know, they're maybe just target against a, you pick a target, power plant, okay, a nuclear weapon. Well, we can, we've proven with the accuracy of our weapon systems now that we, we don't need to put a nuke on that to, to take it out like maybe we used to have to in the Cold War. And that's when I started saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, hold the horses here. You, you can't deter at the same scale with a 2,000 pound bomb as you can with a 100 kiloton weapon. The fear factor isn't there. You throw the fear factor out. You throw away what people call the long dark shadow of the deterrent, which has a psychological impact on a decision maker that is that it may be hard to measure, but is absolutely real. And so the example I use here is for those who would advocate, well, just because of precision and accuracy, there's, a, there's some equivalency between a conventional strike and a nuclear strike. I use this example. I say, let's imagine that, and thank God he did it, but let's imagine that President Bush did not start the, the missile defense, pull out the treaty and start our missile defense capability uh, 18 years ago. So pretend that doesn't exist. And let's give the current dictator in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, the most accurate ICBM in the world. Okay, it is so accurate that he, is, he knows that if he pushes the red button, and he does have one on his desk, okay, that that warhead will impact within the carpet of the Oval Office. That's how accurate it is. It's going to be conventional, though, but it's still pretty darn potent capability. Conventional prompt global strike. Very accurate. Um, and now he gets a little uh, aggressive on the Korean Peninsula and maybe starts invading the South or causing troubles that we want him to stop. Can you imagine that any president of the United States would be deterred from fulfilling our treaty commitments to the South Koreans in this scenario? And I say the answer is no. We're, still getting, we're going to stand up and support him even though he has this cable. I don't care if he has 50 of those things. We're not going to be deterred from going forward. However, if you gave Kim Jong-un a much less accurate intercontinental ballistic missile with, say, a one-mile CEP rather than three foot, and gave him a 20 kiloton warhead equivalent of the Nagasaki weapon, put it on top of that, and took away, remember, we have no missile defense. And now he threatens the United States with that warhead if we come to the aid of the South Koreans. Might that give a future president pause? I think that it, when people start trying to talk about equivalency between conventional strike and nuclear strike, they're heading down the wrong path. And we have to remind them of just how powerful these things are. I did a little math here. And just so I don't have to do it in public, I'll read it to you. So a single 200 kiloton nuclear warhead, which is you know, kind of in the class that you might imagine on top of an intercontinental ballistic missile, that equates to 200,000 Mark 84s, our largest conventional bomb carried by our fighters, 200,000 of them detonating simultaneously. 200,000 times more powerful than this single one uh, kiloton conventional warhead. And uh, these are just astonishing numbers when you start looking at them. This is one warhead. It's the same as uh, it would take 12,000 B-1 bombers to deliver them. Of course, they'd all have to be in formation. 
And, uh, or you could do it at the B-52 with 800,000 Mark 82s. Or, and that would take 8,000 sorties. Or you could do the Moab, that's, that's been in the press lately, it would take uh, 11,000 Moabs simultaneously detonating. Of course, you'd have to have 11,000 C-130s in formation, so roll them out the back end and probably wouldn't be quite as accurate. That's a single warhead. There's just no equivalency in the terror and fear that generates in an adversary's decision calculus. And particularly when you throw on top of that the possibility of fallout and the other destructive power that goes along with it. Another argument you'll hear is conventional, our conventional overmatch, and boy, we heard this at some point, our conventional overmatch um, makes the need for the nuclear deterrent not as important as the past, if, if required at all. And we're just so, so strong and powerful. In fact, we're so strong and powerful, we don't need as many F-22s as we'd like to have. But let me keep on the nuclear side here. So, I mean, you've, you've, heard, you've heard these arguments. They come and go, and it, you understand they're always going to come and go. They're, they're fair arguments to start. But the story I like to tell for young officers when, we, when you hear these things is, um, and many of, unfortunately, the young officers don't remember these days, but I know some in this room will. Who was alive in 85 and remembers the Reagan buildup? Yeah, okay. And what was it going to be? About 600 ship Navy, right? We have less than three, I mean, combat ship Navy. We have less than 300 today. It's going to be 42, I think, combat aircraft wings for the United 47. States Air Force. 47, thank you. You can correct me at 100%. I appreciate it. Um, and Army. I say 18 armored divisions. We don't have armored divisions anymore. We have brigade combat teams. So, I mean, if you can imagine that buildup today, not only will I give you all that, Conventional power. I'll give you all the O&M you need to go to the range every day. Every fighter pilot will be getting 40 hours a month. Okay? They just, they're going to be, it's going to be nirvana, the training factor here. You're going to be so sharp, so capable. Who would dare take on the United States of America in any form or fashion with this powerful conventional force? But I'm going to take away all of your nuclear capability. And to President Maduro of Venezuela, I'm going to give 30 intercontinental missiles and 30 nuclear warheads. Who is the power in the Western Hemisphere in this case? Who has the leg up at the negotiating table on economics, trade, policy? It's not the most powerful conventional force known to man. It's the, the most destructive and feared force that President Maduro would have in his hands. So just you know, when people start telling me that you know, we're so strong conventionally we don't need nukes, I, again, I don't think they really appreciate the magnitude and the power that these weapons have. Well, here's one we've had recently. We don't need a triad. And, and this has been debated uh, many times since we invented it. And I'm totally okay with inventing, debating the triad. What I don't like is when people... Um, simply say we don't need that leg and don't go any further to explain, well, well why, don't, why do you think you don't need that leg? What's the strength and weaknesses? Why do we have that leg in the first place? So, of course, you know, the submarine leg is our survivable leg. Um, it used to be the air breathing leg was our survivable leg, too. And, oh, by the way, it's nice to have redundancy. It can be a survivable leg today. If you put them back on alert and posture them like we did in the Cold War, it was the survivable leg for a long, long, long time. We could scramble them and disperse them which meant they were hard to kill. But the submarine legs are survivable leg today. And not, not many people will ever argue against that. Of course, there's the risk of a transparent ocean someday. Um, it's always been talked about. It's always been feared. And we continually hear, well, it's not going to happen in the next 10, 20 years. But you have to worry about the next 30, 40, 50 years as well. So it's nice to have a hedge there, right? Uh, plus, half that force is always in port and incredibly vulnerable when it's in port. Um, and then you have the, uh, the bomber leg, which we talked about, which is I, not only survivable on alert, but even when we're not using it on alert, has tremendous strength in signaling an essential element of deterrence. You not only got to have the capability, but if your adversary doesn't believe you're going to use it, you can't deter them. You know, if you're the, the pansy walking around the schoolyard with a sledgehammer that you can't even pick up, or <laughs> look like you don't go to the gym often enough to be strong enough to pick it up, no one's going to believe you're ever going to hit them over the head with it. You can't deter anybody. Will, demonstrated will, is very important to the calculus. And sortieing B-52s and sortieing B-2s is an important way to signal your will. 
and to escalate your signals of displeasure with other countries. Further, <clears throat> probably the most important part of the bomber leg of the triad is it supports our non-proliferation policy. And how is that? Well, if you read the purpose of the deterrent, it is to deter attack on the United States and our friends and allies, partners and allies. That second part of that, which is often forgotten by many, is the assurance part of the deterrent calculus. Now, the funny thing about assurance, we don't get to decide if Japan is assured. They decide. They decide. We can't impose assurance upon anybody. And when the TLAM-N was taken out of the inventory in the last nuclear posture review time period, it turns out the Japanese weren't as assured as they were before. Why? Well, they saw that the bombers were off alert. And with the TLAM-N off, that meant the only thing left for an umbrella for them was the ICBM and the submarine launched ballistic missile. Not only did they not believe that the United States would launch an intercontinental ballistic missile in their defense, whether it be from a submarine or North Dakota, they also didn't think the Russians would find that a credible deterrent. They didn't think the Russians would believe that either. The Japanese were kind of going, now this really means you've got to trade Tokyo for New York. Surely you'd be, you'd be, if you launch from the U.S., you will likely be retaliated against on sovereign U.S. soil. They looked at the TLAM-N as a theater weapon that could be launched from within theater against tactical targets outside of the home countries, perhaps, that they would be at war with against fielded forces, say, ships, formations, whatever was threatening them. And they believed that that was a credible deterrent for their defense, one that the Russians and the Chinese would believe and ergo, they were assured. So it took a lot of work after that decision and consultations with them to convince them that no, indeed, we still had cruise missiles we could launch off airplanes so we could put on alert, we still had gravity bombs, and, and we could commit those from deployed locations forward, like Guam and other locations, and the Japanese became assured again. But it was a, it was a great lesson in, for us to understand that we don't dictate assurance. And it is a great strength of the bomber leg of the triad, one that we often forget. And then everyone's favorite target, it seems to be the ICBM. The ICBM, which curiously is the least expensive to operate. It's not, not cheap to deploy, but you know, we dug those holes a long time ago, plan to reuse them. We'll need, we're gonna recapitalize the missiles and life extend the warheads, recapitalize the command and control systems. But, you know, in a world where you eliminate the ICBM leg of the triad, what you leave exposed to both Russia and China is the uh, capability for them to eliminate our entire deterrent, entire deterrent capability with five weapons, with the exception of the submarines that are deployed at sea that day. And day to day, that's less than half the nuclear submarine boats we have in our in inventory. So you kind of do the math on this, and I won't throw out classified numbers, but start is 1550, deployed strategic warheads. You know, with five weapons, they can take out Kings Bay, they can take out Banger, they can take out Mina, they take out Weidman, and they take out Barksdale. Airbnb Lake is totally destroyed. The home-ported submarines are totally destroyed. They have 1,545 weapons left, and we have what few weapons we have left deployed at sea that day which is a much smaller number. Well, does this lead to World War III? Maybe not, maybe it leads to them looking across the table and going, you sure you wanna do anything? Maybe it's game over. Why would we wanna put ourselves in that position? This is called strategic instability, okay? And not many people understand what, you know, you've seen articles written about LRSO, LRSO is unstable, not true. Maybe from an arms race perspective, but even there's no evidence that that has led to that because both sides have LRSOs, equivalents, base scale outcomes. A strategic stability means <clears throat> no adversary of the United States ever wakes up in the morning and says, today's a good day to attack the United States of America, ever. And, what, and why do they calculate different if they got to take out 400 ICBM silos? Well, for one thing, it takes about two warheads a silo. So if you really want to really neuter our capability to retaliate, that's 800 of your 1,550 weapons. That's a substantial investment. And here's the best part. 
as they think about maybe doing this. <clears throat> there's no assurance when those weapons arrive that there's going to be missiles in the ground because we can launch on warning. See how this makes it every day Vladimir Putin wakes up and go, now, not a good day to do this. And by any calculation. And it's because the, the ICBM leg is the most stabilizing leg of the triangle. Try it for strategic stability. And we've got to always remind people of that when they start talking about reducing numbers. Hey, let's give them, how about if we just had 100? Well, there's consequences to that for what they have to target. We want to make this a hard problem for them. <clears throat> and the triad does that. Not only do the legs of the triad back each other up, but they make it a more difficult problem to solve for an adversary. Finally, on the bomber and the LRSO and the need for it, um, you know, we don't have a lot of strategic depth here anymore like we used to have. We used to be able to, at some point during the Cold War, we were making, we were making up to close to 3,000 new weapons a year. Today, Pakistan can make more nuclear weapons than the United States of America. I would venture to say probably North Korea can too. Don't have any intel to support that, but I know Pakistan can make more and is making more new nuclear weapons in the year than the United States. China is as well, Russia is as well. French and the, and, the, and the British are. In fact, the only nuclear power in the world, declared nuclear power in the world, that's not making new weapons is us, who we unilaterally self-constrain. As a result, you know, the infrastructure in place to do that is Manhattan Project era stuff that many, much of it has been dismantled and needs to be recapitalized, frankly. But because of that, you have to protect against the possibility that maybe you got a problem in your Ohio-class boats. Maybe it's generic to the reactor, and the Navy calls up the SecDef one day and says, they're grounded. We're down to two legs. That's a significant portion of our on-alert deterrent that just goes away overnight. You say, oh, that could never happen. Uh, really? Or, or, and something that has happened in, in the historical past. You have a problem with a warhead that takes out an entire class of availability. Now, you don't advertise that for sure, but it's happened. And we've had to go back and fix it and reposture and reconfigure the deterrent. So you, you want to protect against that. Well, the biggest protection we have today is not in our ability to produce our way out of this problem, which we used to be able to do in the Cold War. The, the way we can do this today is in short order, we can have 20 B-52s on alert with 20 outcomes on each B-52. That's 400 independently targeted warheads that will have high probability of penetrating enemy defenses and reaching their targets. That's the hedge we have for technical failure in both the ICBM warhead leg, ICBM leg for the delivery system, and for the submarine leg. And it's a critical part of the, why we need to have the cruise missile continue to be developed and made available for that third leg. Because the bomber is not only important to assurance and signaling, it is our hedge for any failure in any other leg of the, of the triad. So we need to try it. Oh, this one. If I ever hear anybody in this room say this, I'm going to hunt you down. <laughs> Our nuclear ICBMs are on hair trigger alert. That's crazy. I got in trouble giving a speech about this once before the White House had removed it from their website. <laughs> but um, I grew up in the days of, of good cowboys and bad cowboys on TV. And the good cowboys wore white hats and the bad cowboys wore black hats. And you always worried about Black Bart, who warned the sheriff, you know, that my my gun is on. My six shooter's got a hair trigger on it. What did that mean? It's a picture that people are trying to paint in your mind, and they're trying to scare you. It meant that Bart said, you know, if I pull this thing out, <clears throat> yeah, it might go off even if I don't want it to. I might have it pointed at you, and if I sneeze, it goes off. So you better mind your P's and Q's, Sheriff. That's the image people want to paint in the minds of the less informed about the alert status of our ICBM. They're not <coughs> anyway on hair trigger alert. Here's, here's the analogy I like to use. In fact, there is a gun, and it's got a really big bullet in it, OK? <laughs> really big. But that gun is in a holster. And the guy who's wearing the holster, uh, there's two locks on that holster with different combinations. And the guy who's wearing the holster, he doesn't have the combination to either lock, either one. And oh, by the way, even if he did, Take somebody else to help him out. This is the alert posture, not hair trigger, of our ICBM status. Okay? Yes, if the President of the United States says launch these things within very shorter, shorter than the time of flight of a Russian missile, and that's important for strategic stability, those orders can be carried out. But 
they are not on hair trigger alert. They're on deliberate alert for a deliberate and very important reason, strategic stability. So don't let anybody ever get away with calling these things on hair trigger alert. That is purely a scare tactic used by people of my age to try to win the argument. I've already talked a little bit about the LRSO, <clears throat> the argument that it's destabilizing. I don't believe that for a minute. We've had cruise missiles for how long? The Russians have had cruise missiles for how long? <clears throat> Pakistanis are developing cruise missiles. They're not destabilizing. You could argue they might be arms race destabilizing. In other words, back in the day when parity was important to us, it's no longer a part of our policy, I'd point out. You know, if they built one, we had to have one. If they built 10, we had to have 10. And, you know, that turned into a back and forth tit for tat when you got a parity policy on both sides of the ocean. Uh, but we don't see that today. And in no way does the existence of an LRSO invite a preemptive strike, which would be the definition of an unstable strategic circumstance. They just don't. I don't see any logic that supports that. So I would push back strong on uh, folks who would suggest that we shouldn't have the LRSO because it's a destabilizing weapon system. Like, I was, you know, you don't say you were, you never say you were the Air Force programmer. What you say is, I was the hated Air Force programmer. And that is, that's a hyphenated word, okay? <laughs> hated Air Force programmer. <laughs> And so, you know, I, I got to work budgets for three palms, and it was a great learning experience. You learn everything that the Air Force does, because you know what every, where every nickel goes as you go through that process. And when I hear people say we can't afford the triad recapitalization, um, I know these are people who have never done, never been the hated Air Force programmer. You know, I, I, was very, I found it very curious. Some of the first articles that came out said it's going to cost 380 billion dollars to recapitalize the triad. And guess what? Nobody blinked. About three months later, it's going to cost $460 billion, we resharpened our pencil, to recapitalize the triad. Nobody blinked. <laughs> Next article I read, it's going to cost $1.5 trillion to recapitalize the triad and operate it for its 30-year lifetime. Yeah. Well, first of all, if you admit that you need a triad and you and we have, through all the other arguments, then um, you can't count O&M in the bill. If you need a car, what do you worry about? The cost of a new car, because you need a car. You're going to put gas in it. You don't use that in the calculation of whether or not you should buy a car. It's really about the price, right? So it's not fair to, to throw out 1.5 trillion. Yeah. That's, that's an accurate number, maybe an accurate number, for the lifetime of the program. But again, you're just trying to scare us out of making the right investment for the country. Uh, in fact, you should just look at the recapitalization costs in the debate, and yes, we should drive to get them down. But the notion that it's unaffordable is crazy. Even at, even at sequester levels of $600 billion, if you just kept that flat across 10 years of development and 30 years of operation, it's less than 5% of the DOD budget. And we're not going to stay at sequester. We know, well, we have evidence of that now, <laughs> right? And so the total percentage cost is, is going to actually go down, I think, when you look at how budgets will grow as a percentage of the, of the top line. And if you believe my earlier argument that you need these things, and, and no conventional might is equivalent, I say if any dollar spent on conventional capability is wasted taxpayer money if you don't first get this right, the deterrent. That's the foundation. The conventional capability we build on top of that is what we do with the other 90-some percent of the budget and train and operate and pay our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines to uh, live a decent life. Part of the mantra goes, you know, if we would just show some leadership out here, or we need to continue to show leadership to meet our responsibilities for the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is a misquoted quite often, that others will follow suit. We have to maintain the moral high ground here. Well, you know, I just mentioned, so we've done that. You know, we've reduced our forces, but usually in treaties with the Russians. But we've unilaterally stopped producing weapons. We have a unilateral constraint by Congress and by administrations, both Republican and Democrat, to not allow us to develop new weapons, which, by the way, really bothers me because we're about to run out of the human capital that knows how to do this. And we don't, if we don't start tasking people to design new weapons and engineer them and get the technicians to run the lathes 
and put them together and test it and see whether it works. And by that, I don't mean short of detonation. And we can do that. Whether you field it or not, you exercise this thing called human beings that in 20 years, we won't have anybody left that knows how to do that. The last test was in 93. The last weapon we designed and fielded and put in, in the inventory was 1988, the W88. Uh, that's the biggest thing that's atrophying out there. It's not our weapons. We're life extending those. It's the human capital that will be available to some future president, 2030, 2040, 2050, when either the plutonium in our current weapons age out, and yes, it will someday. Great debate on when, but it will. It's physics. Or some change in the geopolitical environment requires more weapons or different kinds of weapons or just new weapons to be built. Is there going to be anybody left in the United States that knows how to do this? I guarantee you, this isn't like you pick up the recipe book and you just go, well, yeah, follow the instructions. Now, there's a bit of, bit of art, a bit of science, a bit of engineering. Um, and what we rely on today is modeling and sim, which as an old test pilot, I've seen bombs come off airplanes that they promised me would go down that went up. <laughs> so this is a very, very scary thing. Our unilateral actions, I see no evidence of our unilateral actions encouraging restraint amongst anybody. In fact, since we adopted this unilateral policy, Pakistan's gone nuclear, India's gone nuclear, Syria tried to go nuclear, Israelis inter interdicted that, uh, Iraq had a nuclear program, we interdicted that, and Libya had a nuclear program. So our, our restraint has not deterred anybody from trying to field their own capability because something that Dr. Cass taught me, I always remember Chile. <laughs> Nations will always behave in their own best interests, not yours. Sometimes they overlap. But there isn't a nation on this planet that sits around and goes, what can I do good for the United States? <laughs> First, they may want to do something good for us if it's in their best interest. So we always got to remember that. Um, I guess the last one I'll touch on is one that, you know, when, you, when they finally run out of um, uh, reasons or ideas for the debate, they'll, they'll say, well, that's just Cold War think. That's, that's when you know you got them, <laughs> okay, in the argument. I suppose uh, machine guns are World War I think, so we don't need those anymore, and uh, tanks are World War II think. You know, they kind of were developed for that. We don't need those anymore. I guess that's just a non sequitur for this argument. They are not Cold War think. They're current day think. As long as there's a country or countries as there are today that hold an existential threat over this country with their nuclear weapons, we need a deterrent. Conventional forces won't do it. Conventional forces won't do it. We need a nuclear deterrent. So don't, don't buy this Cold War think argument. It's not. It's current day think. It's current day think. And we're not thinking enough about it is the problem. I guess I'll, I'll do one more. Uh, and this is probably the most controversial one. But it's one I, yeah, again, this gets back to my love-hate relationship with nuclear warheads and weapons. Uh, you know, I mentioned I was Catholic, and I am. I'm very devout Catholic, and it is the position of the Catholic. When we had our first nuclear deterrence forum at Stratcom, which General Helms organized for me, it was a great forum. It lasted several days. We invited all the heads of the labs to come and speak. We had invited the policymakers to come out. The people that hadn't had a voice in 15 years came out to this. And we also invited all the nuclear powers in the world. So France and England and Russia and China and Pakistan and India came and participated in the conference. And the, by the end of the first day, uh, everybody's fangs were out in the audience. I mean, they, it had been 15 years since they'd heard anybody say anything good about the nuclear deterrent, and here was panel after panel talking about how essential and important it was, not only for the United States, but the other foreign countries were saying how important it was, and how it was important to them that the United States have a deterrent as well. And then that night, I intentionally invited the, uh, the Archbishop of the United States of America for all of Catholics to give the dinner speech and give the policy of the Catholic Church in America on nuclear weapons, which is, of course, opposed to them. It's like someone threw a bucket of cold ice water over everybody. Yeah. It's just the reaction I wanted. So I want, I want people to be thoughtful about these awful, awful weapons. And the Catholic Church position is essentially uh, 
uh, they're too non-discriminatory to be a valid weapon of war. Um, the irony is, is that that non-discriminatory nature of them often helps you do what, he, what you have them for, which is to deter. Not to fight, but to deter. So you'll hear this talk about a world without nuclear weapons and how nice that would be. Uh, it's a goal. It's not a goal of one administration. It's been a goal since Ronald Reagan talked about it. Every consecutive president has talked about reducing, eliminating the elimination of nuclear weapons from the planet. Well, first, I don't think you can put the knowledge back in the, in the ignorance bottle. I don't think you can ever uninvent them. And the folks that advocate for this will say in the same breath, and, and it just, they just never get quoted very precisely on this, that it will take a significant change in the world order for this ever to be possible, and I don't think it will happen in their lifetimes, which I say it won't ever happen. The day it will happen is called, we, we know the day it will happen in my faith, it's called the second coming. <laughs> Before that, you're supposing that the, all the countries of the world would, would yield to some omniscient power and authority that would enforce global zero. Because remember, we, know how, we all know how to make these things. More and more people are learning how to make them. And the material doesn't all go away. How has that worked internationally? The UN? That's a great example of, of, of why this will never work, okay? Because we can't even make it work for the UN today. Then they're not talking about being the omniscient authority, making sure nobody <laughs> cheats on nuclear weapons. So one, I don't think it's possible. But two, I would argue, you know, they, they talk about climbing this mountain to nuclear zero. And at every, every time they go up to a new base camp, everybody reduces a little bit. And we pause and we look around and say, anything bad happen? Nope. Now, the top of the mountain is kind of clouded in fogs, but we're going to keep pressing it. We'll go up a little higher, which means we'd reduce a little more, take another pause and think about it. Anything bad happen? No. This is their story, until finally you reach the summit. I argue we've been at the summit. We have stood on top of that mountain. Mankind stood on top of that mountain until August of 1945. We knew exactly what a world without nuclear weapons looked like. Exactly. It's well documented. And throughout the millennia, I can think of no time when mankind ever did not seek to be more lethal and deadly in the way they waged warfare. Nor did they ever step back from waging warfare. We made it illegal once. How long did that last? There's nothing that suggests to me that humanity is better today than it was in, 19, in you know, July of 1945. No way. The last Adolf Hitler has not been born. The last Stalin has not been born. The last Osama bin Laden has not been born. You can't uninvent these things. But standing on top of that mountain, this is what you would have seen. In World War II alone, the estimated casualty rate, death rate for the world, was somewhere between 60 and 80 million human beings killed in a six-year period, from September 39 until August 45. And to do math in public and keep it easy for my simple brain, I'll pick a middle, somewhat middle number of 72 million. Dead, not casualties, dead. Casualties is a number usually about three times that. Includes wounded. 72 million dead people in six years. Six into 72 is 12. A million a month. Every month, on average, for six years. Divided by 30 days. About 32,000 a day, every day, for six consecutive years. Yeah, there's been wars since then. We lost about a day and a half worth of those, casual, of those deaths in Vietnam, total. A day's worth in Korea, US, US law. Nothing scales like the horror of World War II and what it did to the humanity on this globe. And that was a world without nuclear weapons. And what did it take to end it? And what has been our history since then? No major power wars, certainly not between countries that have the deterrent since then. Now, can you prove it's always going to be that way? No. Can you increase the probability it won't happen? Yes, by having a strong deterrent. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. OK, did I, did I leave any time, Dave? 10 minutes for questions? Please, yeah. Fire away. Great, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, General Shelton. Yeah. 
I'd like to talk about another aspect of deterrence, or have you mm -hmm. speak about it, and that's extended nuclear deterrence. Yeah. Something you didn't exactly mention, although you know we have these great relationships. And I'm just wondering, is it just unique to the American experience to drape uh, in the way that we do? Because perhaps that's one of the failures in the Korean thing, is that none of our adversaries, like Russia or China, are able to assure North Korea that they don't need their own. To what degree does extended nuclear deterrence, could it be valuable for other nuclear powers to do that for their adjacent political spheres? Yeah, uh, good question. I, I, I kind of thought I covered assurance, which is extended deterrence. I just used a different word, but that, that is, and, and you're right. Um, uh, we, I think we're pretty unique in this regard. We are unique, but you got to start with, um, so, how many close allies does Russia have? Really? Who are they going to extend it to? Belarus? That's about it. You know, and that's not necessarily an alliance. And then you look at China. Who are their close allies and partners? You, you, you posit maybe North Korea. and Maybe they could offer an umbrella to North Korea uh, and, uh, and, and dissuade uh, Kim Jong-un from developing or, or get him to dismantle what he's done so far. I've not thought anything about that. I think it, that would be an interesting discussion. I think there's you know, always my antenna go up uh, whenever I hear anything associated with uh, North Korea and China because, um, well, particularly North Korea, because they're liars. You know, why, why, why we think, you know, my view on North Korea is, you know, Kim Jong-il, I'm sorry, Kim Il-sung, wrote the playbook in the 50s and 60s, gave the playbook to his son, who gave it to his grandson. The playbook hadn't changed. What changes over on our side of the pond is the administration every four or eight years, and everyone comes in and thinks we can outsmart these guys and negotiate with them. <laughs> and they just open up their playbook and go, new president, here's what we do. That's what they do. There's, there's nothing new that I'm seeing going on here. What's new, and people ask me this all the time, my daughter's stationed over in Korea. I was just over there visiting her. Because I've been asked a bunch, are they really tense over on the peninsula? No. They've been living under this threat, whether it was chemical, biological, in artillery range in Seoul, 25 million people in the greater Seoul area, which is the entire population of Australia, for crying out loud, and a river to the south of them they got across to escape a, an invasion force or an artillery. They've been living under this since 1953. And they don't believe for a minute, in general, that it's going to happen. What's changed is now the guy up north can touch us. And suddenly we're paying attention, for good reason. For good reason. Not just touch us, but our allies, Japan, in, in the theater outside of South Korea. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'd have to think about it. But I'm sure that uh, the notion of encouraging that with China is uh, probably something policymakers have thought about and rejected, because I haven't heard anybody talk about it out loud. So, but I don't know. Yes? What, what are your thoughts? What are they? Well, first, that was an amazing talk, so thank you very much oh, for that. Pleasure. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, and it was very informative. But what, one of the big concerns you hear these days, and you hear it in the press a lot and, uh, and throughout the public, is one person can give the command, the President of the United States. What are your thoughts on, on that and uh, any concerns? It's always been that way. I think it's the right thing. Only the President can direct the release of nuclear weapons in this country. And I think it's exactly what, the way we should be postured to do that. Now, he's got he's to pass that order down through officers who are sworn to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, not the President. You gotta remember that. It's unique to us as well, unlike in other societies. But it's, I, I think you have to hold it at the various highest, and I think as Americans, when we vote, we ought to consider that. Uh, but remember, again, the principal reason we have this is to deter, to deter. Lanny? Thank you, Chile. Thank you for a fantastic presentation and, and the point you just made completely casually, we ought to consider that while we vote. That actually should be more in the public domain. It's the first time I heard anybody say that. My question is about the so-called new notion of escalating to de-escalate, mm -hmm. which leads in the new nuclear posture review mm -hmm. to the recommendation to develop lower yield 
nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. I, I would like you to show you. Yeah, so, so there was a change in, in the Russian declaratory policy in the last several years um, under Vladimir Putin. And although the Chinese have a, a publicly stated no first use policy, if you read their documents, you drive a truck through that statement. And they, in fact, have a very similar policy underlying that, which is, you know, uh, if they're going to be losing a conventional fight, they don't rule out pulling out the uh, low, low yield, uh, well, is often referred as tactical, although it's hard to imagine that there's such a thing. But theater, I would say, theater nuclear weapon that doesn't impact the United States of America, but would impact US or allied forces in a fight, uh, and maybe their territory. That's a, it's a, a, a dangerous, I think, change in policy. One might argue, well, that was our policy in, in the 1970s, when we had conventional overmatch in uh, Europe. Uh, and so, rather than redeploy our entire army and all those tanks that we had just brought home um, in the 50s as the threat increased in the 60s, we, you know, and I'm, some people in this room probably sat Nuke Alert over in Zulu Alert over in Germany and England, and we had nuclear artillery rounds in the U.S. Army inventory, Honest John uh, rockets, recoilless rockets, nuclear landmines that were going to be deployed along the Fulda Gap. And that, and we said, you cross, we're going to use these things. That was our way to deter. What's different is Putin's, he, he tries to characterize it in, you know, if, you know if, you're, if we're losing this fight on Russian soil, we'll pull these things out. But no, what he's really saying is if we invade Lithuania and Estonia and the Baltic states and we start to lose, or you come to their defense, we just might use these things. That's what he's saying. That's what, certainly what we're hearing. And then it gets into a discussion, well, if that's what he's saying, which is an escalate to de-escalate policy, do we... Do we offer the President of the United States as the Department of Defense and Department of Energy, do we offer the current or future President the right tools to one, deter, has to be credible, believable, and two, if deterrence fails, to win. Again, I use a bit of, it's not a real good example, but if all you have is a sledgehammer in your backpack, all you have, you know, people might come up and kick you in the shins. You're not going to hit me over a head sledgehammer with it because with, I kicked you in the shins. Now, if I kick your mom in the shins, you might hit me over there with a sledgehammer. But come on, I might just give you a little shove. You're not going to kill me for that. I just might. And so here's the real danger, miscalculation on the part of the adversary. So Putin thinks he can shoot a half a kiloton artillery round at U.S. fielded forces that are threatening to retake that land. A half a kiloton. I mean, that was about the size of our 155 in the Cold War. That didn't sound like very much. Half of a thousand tons. That's 500 Mark 84s going off. <laughs> right next to your command post or over your formation. There's, there's videos of, of these 155s shooting out in the desert. And it's not a small nuclear explosion that goes off from a half a kiloton. It's very significant. You may calculate that surely with a half kiloton shot at fielded forces in Poland, for crying out loud, what do you care? We won't do anything. Well, surely we might. And if, sh and if all we have, and he may calculate that because he realizes our smallest weapon is a 100 kilotons to pick a number. Now, the US wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, we might. You don't want to put a president of the United States in a position to have to make that decision, nor do you want Russia, in this case, to miscalculate. So you, you have to demonstrate the, the will that uh, not only uh, are you not going to get away with it, but if you do it, we have tools at hand to do what deterrence promises it will do. Either inflict unacceptable pain or deny the benefit you seek. And um, that's the argument for these lower yield weapons. I like the argument of uh, rather than just modifying things, uh, there's a great opportunity to get our design agencies at work to build something new. And it doesn't have to have uh, um, you know, a capability that we, we, we fielded so many different kinds of weapons, we, all different yields that uh, it, it, I would make it a new design only to exercise the, the infrastructure and the people. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be some whiz-bang, you know, out-of-the-box device. It'll be something that works and has the appropriate yield and flexibility, which is also key, um, to deter. And at the end of the day, it's not just a weapon. I think we need a strategy. You know, the NPR... Uh, gave us a couple of tools to develop. 
But that's not what you need. You need, a dip, you need to use all elements of national power. Diplomacy, you know, you got to get our allies involved in this. We got to get the world paying attention to this. Declaratory policy, which is bad. Bad for the West and ultimately bad for the Russians if they ever step into it, if they ever use it. And we need to get them to change the policy. And that's not going to get changed by just fielding a couple of weapons. We need a, we need a strategy. Last question is General Schwartz. Yes, thanks, Chief. Chile, uh, thanks again for being the articulate spokesman for deterrence that you are. You mentioned earlier theater weapons. Would you comment on how DCA contributes to deterrence? I sure will. Thanks, Chief. That's a great question. Because once upon a time when I was, uh, as John Handy would say, when I was an early programmer, I remember when I was young and stupid. <laughs> John had, General Handy had been the programmer. That's when I tried to retire the band. <laughs> he said, <laughs> yeah, he said, I tried that once. Get out of here. <laughs> I tried to, at one point, I argued for the closing down of our nuclear storage sites in Europe to save money. It was, you know, early 2000s. Well, we need these things for anyway. And I'm having a senior moment. The great American was in the NSC staff at the time doing policy. And no kidding, we were in Dr. Cambone's office, and he was ready to, he was the PA and E, he was ready to sign up for the offset. And I'm, I'm danger close to making 400 million bucks for my Air Force to go buy more whatever we else we needed. When, uh, I'll think of this guy's name in a minute. He walked, who was it? It wasn't Frank. No, it wasn't Frank. Well, no, it wasn't Frank. It wasn't Frank Miller. Anyway, he walks in and, and he makes a last ditch plea to Cambone and says, we haven't had time to consult with our allies. Just give us a, another year and we'll do it. Uh, and so he said, okay, well, Another year came and there's no way that offset was going in ever again. I didn't understand how, not only uh, from a deterrence perspective, but how politically important, and that's another part of the calculus, the NATO deterrent is. Uh, and it's deployed on uh, dual capable aircraft in NATO, both conventional, we delivered both conventional nuclear capability. We control the weapons, but they have the mission and they're required to plan the mission. So it wasn't a STRATCOM job. My view today is it's, it's as important as ever to keep uh, the NATO, NATO alliance, alliance involved in this mission set. But I would even go further than that from an Air, U.S. Air Force perspective because, because NATO uh, controls the planning and execution of, of these weapons, uh, I think you, you always wonder when the Russians look across the border and they, although they say NATO is, you know, they're not our borders and they're so powerful, they know NATO's capability, and they also know how long it takes to get a decision made in NATO. You know, and if, by the time NATO makes a decision, they won't just be in the Baltics. <laughs> if they wanted to go further west, they would go a lot further west, waiting for a NATO decision to employ. And then the notion that NATO would employ first in that scenario, probably unlikely. So one thing the NPR does talk about is the U.S. unilateral DCA capability which I think can serve as a broader deterrent than the NATO capability. So I'm in support of the NATO capability for the political alliance. But I'm also in support of, for example, accelerating the Block 4 software development for the F-35 so it can carry a B-61. You know, when you look at the IADs that Russia is deploying in, in Europe and that China is deploying, they both have a, pol a, a strategy of pushing us out with uh, air defense systems that would keep us from penetrating. Uh, I would like them to know if they executed their policy of escalate to de-escalate that we can do the same damn thing with an F-35 that you can't shoot down. In other words, we can penetrate in a, in a force package or whatever it takes. So I, uh, it calls out for a worldwide deployable DCA capability for our forces, not just NATO forces. And I think that, that can help uh, put pressure on North Korea, for example. We don't have to put uh, weapons back on the peninsula, but you know they violated the, the agreement. We said, we'll take ours off and you won't develop them. We took ours off, and they developed them. Uh, and, and if it's too politically hard to put them back on the peninsula, it's not too politically hard to put them in Guam. It's a very powerful signal, one that our allies would really appreciate as an umbrella. And I think it's a very powerful counter signal to both the Chinese in the Southeast, South China Sea and the Daiyu Islands, Senkaku Islands, and the East China Sea. 
and to the Russians in Eastern Europe of our will. Yeah, don't, don't, don't miscalculate. That's kind of where I land. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I think all of you will agree with me. That was a magnificent uh, tour de force, uh, Chile. And by the way, it wasn't 28 years ago. It was 30 years 38 years ago. I was going to say, you're giving us credit. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is the, the anniversary of the centennial end of World War I, yes. which is you kind of alluded to in your comments about what happened when we didn't have nukes. Right. That was supposed to be the war that ended all wars, yeah. and it didn't. And while we don't know for sure, what you talked about may at least be able to put a cap on it. But as, as a thanks, we've got a book for you here, the Lafayette Escadrille Photo History of the First American Fighter Squadron. It's got a lot of pictures in it. Good. I can read it then. So we <laughs> figure on the way back. You can take a look. But, uh, but thanks very much for being thanks, here. Dave. And I know uh, General sure. Chilton's got a plane to catch, but he may be able to stick around for a little bit. Yeah, I can. Yeah. To answer some of your questions sure, that you didn't get to. And thanks to visit. Again. Thanks, buddy. Thank you all for coming.